figure parts. Right. Okay, let's begin. So we're starting with a, uh, a whole new set of laws. It's a hakdama, it's a preface to the halachas of my Yakum foods that are <clears throat> prohibited when they're made or prepared by a non-Jew. These are rabbinic in nature, these laws. Which means to say, you're not, <clears throat> you're not gonna find a reference for them directly in the Chumash. You might find an allusion to them in the Chumash, but not a direct reference. The Chacham established certain laws with regards to the food that we consume. In particular, the bread that we eat, the cooked foods that we consume, and the milk that we consume as well. And they said that these foods have to be governed by a certain set of, I would say some boundaries, okay? They have to be governed by certain boundaries. Just to, to before you actually read the introduction inside, on page your base, uh, rather page one base, page 52. By way of an example, at your Shabbos table, speak to any shliach, a Shabbos table, the aura, the atmosphere is magical in a sense where it can really draw people in. And sometimes just that experience itself will, will, will bring them closer to Yiddishkeit. It's not what you say necessarily, but it's the experience that they experience. So the power of food is very, very strong. My father, a blessed memory, came to Lubavitch in 1962. And he told me that when he met the Rebbe Shluchim in Penn State University, actually it was 1961, of social Chabez, um, he said, it's not what they said that made an impression on me. It's the, I felt something here. I felt something that you know, touched with your fingers. I was experienced. So Chazal said that if we're going to have a certain level of a boundless interaction between the Jew and the non-Jew without any restriction, just in a totally free way, it could lead to intermarriage and lead to to the closeness of Kirva built Ritsuya. Now, just to bring this point out even further, the beauty of every nation is when each nation can, can specialize in what they do. There's a book by Rabbi Zalman Posner, a blessed memory called Think Jewish. I highly recommend that you read it. I read it about 35 years ago. And in the book, he brings out the following point. He says that you have Mexican cuisine, you have Indian cuisine, you have Mediterranean cuisine, <clears throat> Israeli cuisine, Russian cuisine. You have every country, every, every national, every culture has their unique flavor profiles, the recipes, right? It's a certain kind of, it's, it's an experience. Imagine if one day some chacham wakes up and he says, we're going to make a new cuisine. We're going to take Russian cuisine. We're going to take Indian cuisine. We're going to take Italian cuisine. We're going to take Israeli cuisine, Mediterranean cuisine. We're going to take Indian cuisine. We're going to mix it all together and make a chalet and serve it to you. You get, you get nauseous. It's not just that you don't have the same value as the other cuisine. You don't have the other cuisine anymore. It destroys the other cuisine. And he used that as a parable to say that the Jewish nation, its beauty is its beauty is when it stands on its own. And, and God forbid when there's intermarriage, it's not just a disservice to the Jewish nation, which it is a terrible disservice. It's also a disservice to the non-Jewish nation because the non-Jews themselves, of course, have their God-given mandates, just like you have with the cuisine and, and to create, to, to enable that everyone can do what they're, they're the God-given mandate is, everyone has to be able to be in their element, so to speak. In addition, I want to point out that the Allah is a pass, fish on follow. If you look in Allah in Aleph, page and base, in, in the first bullet point there, in the first paragraph, when it comes to bread baked by a non-Jew, or foods cooked by a non-Jew, or milk that was milked by a non-Jew, even though those are rabbinic in nature, their, their structure is such to protect against a violation of an isotaita. 
So for example, we say that a Jew has to be present by the milking of the cow to make sure that they don't mix in milk from a non-kosher animal. So even though the actual law of Chal of Yisrael is rabbinic in nature, it's designed to protect against violating an Torah. Make sense? And now we're going to quote the Rambam, Halacha Beis. V'zeh Lashna Rambam, V'yeshom Devar Machei Masru Yisrael Chacham Hapi She'ein Yisur Mikrim in HaTorah. There's some things that the Chacham Asr, they prohibited, even though there's no Ikrim in HaTorah, meaning there's no actual source in the Torah for them. In order for us to be distant from the non-Jews, actually it's horrible when you throw, in order that the Jews and the non-Jews don't come to mingle, the Yavid and the Chastas are going to come to intermarry to one another. Allah Gimel says about the Jewish nation, it says, thank you. In Amla, it says in the Torah, the Jews dwell alone and they don't become, they're not reckoned with the non Jews. The Jews are a nation unto themselves, they don't mingle. Hashem, God's given mandate to us is that we should be separate. How do we achieve our, our wholesomeness, our destiny? Our God-given mandate, only when we're separate from the Umayyads, from the nations, and we cleave to God. Then they will be able to achieve their mandate, their purpose. Because we're a, a nation of priests and, and a holy nation, whose, whose purpose is we're supposed to give, off, give forth and illuminate the light of Hashem the Cholay and to the whole world. As it says in the Pasuk, and I will bring another Pasuk to support this, it says in the Navi, it says in Yishayahu, I will make you a light unto the nations. There's many stories of people, if they had, you know, if they were mingling with the non-Jews, the non-Jews would say that it would remind them that they're Jewish. Because a non-Jew doesn't feel comfortable when a Jew mingles with them too closely, because it's not good for the non-Jew either. So sometimes they become the shliach to actually help the Jew get back in their, in, where they need to be on track. But if they're, if they're cleaved with the, with the non-Jews, not only are they not going to be able to be mashpia, be able to give forth and give over, Hashpa. Hashpa means to be able to, to be an influence, a positive influence on the non-Jews. They're going to be influenced by them. They mingled with the non-Jews and, and you learn from their ways. You start to become just like them. People that learn to marry, they take their daughters as wives. They're going to an idol worship. It causes a, it's, a, it's the most greatest, it's the greatest destructive force in Jewish life. Do not marry them. Your daughter should not marry their son. Your daughter should not take for your son. It's that if the person goes in that direction, it brings about destruction, it brings about the disintegration of Jewish life. So if a Jew is has an unwanted closeness to the non-Jew, it's not good for everybody, for them and for the world. Even for the non-Jews themselves, it's not good. Because then they're going to miss out on the on the light of the nations. They're going to illuminate things for them. I'm sorry? Okay. Oh, that's a question. That's a whole fabrengan. <laughs> it's good. It's good. Yeah, I'm on a, I'm on a bit of a health kick right now. So. But I like smoothies. I, I start having smoothies every morning. Anyway, um, no, what happens is basically I, eat, I have smoothies in the morning and I eat well till about five o'clock and then start to eat the junk food. Oh. So I'm trying to get better. Oh. Trying to get better. 
in my house. My wife has to hide the chocolate and stuff like that. And I used to. Is it what? Like that? Yeah, it could be. Anyway. Allah hey, I'll keep Tava Kashbok on the Tuna Soma Sailam, Tuna Soma Sailam, Shane Sailor Kavasino. So a Nanju is not going to be able to tolerate, they won't be able to, they're going to find it uncomfortable to get too close with them. I mean, the Shonam is Tama Karvin Lahem. But you see me, the Himdechim, Mechik Moisim, they're going to push us away because they want us to be who we're really supposed to be. The Gumas Nasha Kosbatev, Miss Machartem, Shomle Vechavin Kreina. You're offering to sell, there's no buyers, meaning to say that they're, gonna, they're not going to want to be close. But see us, Kazu, Kalal Yisrael. If the, if the Kali Yisrael becomes like the nations, it has no, it will have no everlasting kind of effect. And, and the people will not be able to tolerate it because the nature won't be able to, um, there's no need, for, there's no tafas, no purpose in that. Only with a, a pure nation, with its true ultimate purpose. Very interesting, huh? So what's interesting is that the non-Jews themselves feel uncomfortable because I, because every every person is special. A non-Jew is very special in the elements and the purpose that God gave them. So once they're put into a position where they're 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 really out of their element, they're going to also react to it. It's out of their element if the Jew gets too close to them. Yeah. Just like if you're taking Mexican cuisine and mixing it with Indian cuisine or Israeli cuisine, they're going to say, "Hey, this doesn't taste good." <laughs> That's why they remind us. On the day we went to Golos, so when we forget this evdol, this this differentiation, so that the non-Jews remind us. Now, Allah Chazai gets into the power of food. If you look, every Jewish, Jewish event in the world, except for a fast day, involves food. Look at every flyer from every, every Chabad house, every event. It's always food. Latkes is going to be hamantashin, or Pesach is going to be the Suda. It's always food. And it's not because we're so, uh, I would say, ameshed in Gashmis. It's because the food is very important when it's used for the, for the right purposes of Hashem. The food represents and the foods have, are symbolic of whatever yomtiv they represent. Coming up to Hanukkah, like my last name, latkes, oil, all that stuff. Showing. So, but the food also brings people close together. If you talk to people, even people who are not religious, if they had a seder, they're going to talk about their grandmother's recipe, whatever she made for the soup, or, or the borscht, or whatever, whatever recipe she made, there's a certain fondness, there's a certain kind of sense of bonding that happens over the food. So that's the way Hashem created us. That's the way we're wired. So in, in that kind of a setting, if you have a, if you have a Jew and a non-Jew, there has to be certain boundaries. So also a Jew should not go in and just mingle with non-Jews. So if, if, let's say someone works in a, with a bunch of non-Jewish people and they have, let's say, a work party. The Shaila, it's not so simple what you have to do, what you can do. I'm not going to answer you. You know, every situation is a little bit different, but I'm just going to answer in general. It's a Shaila that has to be asked. I'll tell you what my father of blessed memory used to do. My father was a magician. Besides being a scientist, and the Lubav Shafas, was very close to the Rebbe, which is, of course, the most important thing. He was, a, he was also a magician. He was, before he became from, he was an amateur magician in college, and he used to do magic shows by all the Chabad events, and et cetera. Anyway. So as a scientist, he worked in a non-Jewish company. They'd have these holiday parties, whatever it is, Thanksgiving, whatever, New Year's parties. And, and he, so what did he do? He would go in for a few minutes and he would do the magic show. He brought his, his you know, his, his magic case with him, with all his toys, whatever. He did a show. He would take a little drink of soda and that was it. And he'd leave. So he didn't mingle with them per se. He had to be there because he couldn't show that he's, uh, he's but he did it in a way where he still showed he's separate. That's the, that's the, the goal we're trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. I once had a business meeting with a bunch of executives. Of course, it was a kosher restaurant. So I was with uh, like five, it's all men, it's like five or six guys. 
big buyers from a big company. And, and, and it, was, it was kind of interesting because I'm sitting there, these non-Jews and they're, they're drinking, having a good time, you know. And I, and I realized I have a, besides what I had to do for the business, I had to talk to them about something. It was about kosher, developing a program but I also tried to use an opportunity to elevate them, to lift them up. Shlichas, right? So you have to try wherever you are to try and spread a little light. Anyway, so now that I have Darshan, let's, let's read inside. People start to get, um, when people sit together and eat, they, they start to... Uh, feel more comfortable, they, let, they kind of let their guard down usually, and they just feel a little bit more, a sense of bonding. It can draw one's heart and can bring to intermarriage. It can also bring out to, uh, to idol worship. Which is again, one's daughter is going to their sons, their sons going to their daughters, to your daughters, etc. The Jewish people have to be separate from the non-Jews in regards to their food and to their drink. How do we achieve this separation? We shouldn't eat their foods from their foods and we shouldn't drink their drinks. So, so it's, even if the food was kosher, if they made it, it's a problem uh, under most circumstances. I'll, I'll, I'll explain the details later. I'll tell you a story in a moment, by the way, about this. Just, well, just let me finish and I'll tell you a story, then I'll answer your question. Through us not being able to just mingle with them, it's going to help prevent us from marrying them. If at the time of Pinchas in the Chumash, if Stam Yenam Shalnach, which means regular wine from an was already prohibited, then the Jews would not have stumbled with the doors of Midian and the story with Balpar. Only because they drank with them, they came to sin, as it's brought down the Gemara in Sanhedrin. Before I get to your question, Tom, I just want to make a point that there's, someone came to the Rebbe. I believe this story is, is, is a video about it. Maybe it's on the Living Torah or something. There was a, a bunch of rabbis got together. And they were trying to brainstorm how they could prevent intermarriage on college campuses. Jewish boys and girls, they were not religious. They went to college and they would, you know, meet a very common, a, non, a Jewish boy would meet a non-Jewish girl and a Jewish girl would meet a non-Jewish boy, etc. So there are all kinds of different things. They were thinking of making programs. And yeah, the Rebbe said, Establish kosher cafeterias. Because you have a kosher cafeteria, so the Jews, the boys and the girls, they're going to mingle, they're going to be with each other. So, so that's going to help they'll serve as a fence that they're not going to mingle with the non Jews because you mingle around the, time, around, the around the table when you're eating, which is based on this thing in Torah. It wasn't that the Rebbe just came up with a, uh, a nice idea. The Rebbe was rooting it in Titus. That's what, the, that's what the Rebbe advised them to do, and of course they did it. Okay, question. Yes. Yes. Um, so um, they separate everything, including uh, the boy will preserve food just to keep the between. Okay, so now we're asking how is what's considered separate? The Chacham established certain parameters, certain rules. A non Jew is allowed to help in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. it's not but the, the light the fire, the, the fire has to be, the, the cooking has to be done by a Jew, meaning a Jew has to light the fire. I'll explain in detail exactly. There has to be a certain, a, a significant amount of Jewish involvement. A non-Jew cannot do everything from beginning to end. So we have a, we have a in my house, for example, thank God we have a non-Jewish woman, she comes and helps clean, or else the place, we, we go crazy by now, thank God we have that help. And, but, but we, she doesn't touch any fires. Yesterday I was home, or my wife is home, wherever's home, she wanted me to warm up some food. It was already cooked. It's really ready visually to throw. She's according to Jewish law, she's allowed to warm it in the microwave, but I don't allow her because I don't want to start making mistakes. No food, no, no fires. So she puts, you know, she tells me what she wants, and I warm it up for her. So 
there has to be a, a certain amount of involvement is allowed, but under certain circumstances, not that they can't just go ahead and just cook everything. We need to light the fire? Yes. Yeah. And all the rest they can do? As long as you make sure they're not mixing up all the meat, yes. yes. So in kosher terms, all the going to work. Mashkiach lights all the fires. Mm -hmm. The first thing Mashkiach does, he comes in, he lights fires. All the fires, ovens and stoves, everything. So it's so it's. Uh, there's a get There's a certain kind of framework. Like Hamu said they didn't say you can't have an Andrew in that kitchen. Yeah, but so it's not only one hundred percent sure if Mashgiach is there all the time. A restaurant has to have a front person all the time. Could be the owner if the if the dati. Mm -hmm. A restaurant has to have a shomer shabbat all the time because a restaurant is uh, a lot of stuff going on there. It's not. Uh, there's a lot of change happening all the time. It's a fluid environment. That's yeah, but in Israel, it's not Jewish. So. Yeah. 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 In, in Israel, in Israel, sometimes they allow a non shema Shabbat. A non shema Shabbat can also light the fire. Okay. So there's different opinions about it. It's better it to be a, a shema Shabbat. But if it's a place with all Jews, some people are a little bit more lenient over there, depending on the hechsha, depending on the level. So that's a totally base, uh, you know. Mm -hmm. We once had a discussion, it was interesting. We had the Rav Rashi, uh, Rav Rav Amar Shlita was, uh, he was, when he was the Rav Rashi, Israel, started, he was in America. You know, he came to the office and said, okay, so we, we greeted the Rav and we sat together. So he asked us about Bishr Yisrael, how they do it here. So he said in, in Eretz Yisrael, because everybody's Jewish, they allow, you know, even someone who's not Dati to light the fire, the Rabbanut allows. The they require someone to be Shema Shabbat. But I said, I, so I said to the Rav, I said, that works in Eretz Yisrael because everybody's Jewish, or well, most people are Jewish. In America, you have a lot more non Jews. If you have a, a non, let's say you have a Jew who's not religious as a restaurant, there'll be so many non Jews around. How do you know they're the one turning on the fire, not the non Jew? You can't have such a system there, so it's different. So he agreed with me. Anyway, anyway now can I forbring a little bit? Yes. Oh, can we say a little word? I was by a Fabreng and I can't help it. What can I do? It's a it's, it's just Kislev, Hanukkah, it's a lot. It's a, it's a holy time. Anyway, so I was by a Fabreng on Tuesday night. By Rabbi Mangel. Rabbi Mangel, Rabbi Nisim Mangel is a very special person. He translated the Siddur, tremendous Talmud Chacham. See this nigga. Anyway, and he knows the stories, he knows everything. Amish. He's like, you would say he's like a mayan amiskaba, which means he's a wellspring that keeps giving. Once he opens the pot, the faucet, it just gets more and more. Anyway, so he said a word. He said he was, he was finishing the Tanya. So the, well, the end of the Tanya, the Alter Rebbe speaks about the mitzvah of Shabbos. Ilchus rab Shabbat, keeping Shabbos carefully, etc., etc. So he asked the question, he says, how come Alter Rebbe chose the mitzvah of Shabbos? Tayag mitzvah, the 613 mitzvahs, why is after Shabbos? So many other mitzvahs they could have chosen to speak about at the end. So he says that the whole Indian of Tanya is to bring the Yidin to Mashiach. It's a terrible chassidus, right? To bring us to Mashiach. So he says, Shabbos is, Shabbos is, is, is the Indian of Liyem Shekul Shabbos and Ruchal Chai Elam. It refers to Mashiach. And it's also Shabbos, also Yisrael of Tasha, which is Tshuva. The whole Indian of Tanya is to bring a person to the, the Mashiach and Tshuva. That's why that was Messiah. Because it's, it's the theme of the entire, the entire Sefer and everything. Everything's been doing it. And I was kicking myself. I said, how come I never thought of that before he said that? Okay, whatever. Anyway. Okay. Anyway. You know what? I'm going to tell you another story because I tend to do that once I say one. You know, once you open the faucet, it doesn't close so fast. But anyway, today... Um, This is a little bit. We love to hear stories. I have to also teach a little bit so that I, I don't get into trouble. But uh, anyway, so there's there's a story I heard from somebody. There was a, it's a little bit sad. Rabbi Reichik from Rav uh, Chirov in, in Los Angeles. Rabbi Shimi Reichik unfortunately passed away yesterday. Very special Jew. Um, and I had a relationship with him. 
So he knows that I work in Kashrus and we're, we're related, standard related, because my brother married Rabbi Reichik's youngest sister. So anyway, so Rabbi Reichik used to tell me, told me some stories about Kashrus that he knew from the previous generations. I want to share these stories with you. Just as it's close for his neshama. And then I'll tell you a, a sequel to the story. There was a Rav, his name was Rabbi Chaim Goldzweig. He lived in Chicago. His father was a Chesidish Edebe. Rabbi Chaim Goldzweig, he's a Dab Nusachari. He passed away like in the early, like 2005 or something, like 15, 16 years ago. He was a Kashrus expert, world renowned Kashrus expert. He used to visit factories on behalf of the OU, but he was a world renowned expert. People would, would ask him questions and childless. Rabbi Reichik's father, Rabbi Shmuel Dabar Alevi Reichik, Rabbi Shlomo was a Bainani. He used to ask Rabbi Chaim Goldzweig, this is for us. He would ask to try to make sure which products are Mahudr. Because, you know, it's, it's, as a national shkacha, they, it's kosher, but it's not always the most Mahudr, depending on the situation. He would always ask which is most Mahudr. And Rabbi Chaim Goldzweig would tell him. Rabbi Chaim Goldzweig was by the Rebbe in Yechid, like 50 years ago. And he, even though he wasn't a Lubavitcher, but he was a Chassidish Yid, and he was a Dabna Sakhari, a Shaykh of Lubavitch, and the Rebbe asked him to speak for the Sheikh Abad about Kashrus. So he said to the Rebbe, these are Yireim and Shleimim, which means these are holy Jewish women. What am I going to tell them? These are religious people. So the Rebbe said that they're machmer on things they don't have to be machmer on, and they're makel on things they shouldn't be makel on. They're leaning on things they shouldn't be leaning on. So therefore, you have to tell them so they should have more clarity and have a more of a balanced approach. And that was a story that Rabbi Reichik told me. And it gives me a lot of uh, inspiration. That's what I try and, and do by teaching and sharing. Anyway, so that was a story I heard from him about a year or two ago. Three months ago, Rabbi Reichik was in, I was in, I in 77 in Chodesh El. And that, just that morning, it happens to be, I brought my Sefer Tanya with me because we were, it was in the Geras HaKodesh. I was learning the, the teachers of that day. But well, Daniel was going to learn it. I had the Sefer with me. And Bashkoch HaPratis, Rabbi Reichik, was in, was in New York at the time. I think there was a family wedding. And he came and sat down right next to me. Mommy, I felt right away. I knew I'm going I'm to get something out of this. I knew this is not, I'm going to, I'm going to, how should I say? I'm going to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to gain some spiritual energy over here. Suck the food a little bit. Something's going to happen over here. So he asked me if he could borrow my Sefer. I said, good one today. So I lent him the Sefer. He starts learning Tanya. And I'm getting ready for Dominic. And he, after he finishes the Tanya, he says to me, on his own, he tells me the following story. He says, Rabbi, Rabbi, Rabbi Chaim Goldsar, was by the Rebbe. There was a time when he wanted to leave the OU. I don't know the exact reason. Maybe because he, 50 years ago, there were a lot of leniencies. They don't, they don't do so much today. But maybe because of that, I don't know the reason, but he wanted to leave. And the Rebbe says, you're not allowed to leave. The Rebbe did not let him leave. Because when a person has a, a spiritual mandate and a shlichus, that's it. This is your place. You got to be there. You got to keep going. Why keep on trucking. Why do you want to leave? I don't know why. But the Rebbe didn't let him leave. And, 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 and he told me that story. And I was going through my own internal question. And the Rebbe answered my question through that story. You also want to leave? I, I didn't want to leave, but I had a question about a certain, why I'm doing a certain thing. I think about a project. And, and he said that the Rebbe can't, and the Rebbe answered me through it. And I was very touched by the whole experience. Anyway, so because I had a relationship with him, I felt I should share this with the, with the, with the class. He's a chassid shiit, he's a warm person. And um, he kind of, you know, you would say, he, he carried the demust yekne shalav, he carried the image of his father with him. You saw in his face, you can kind of get a sense of who his father was. His father was, uh, I'll tell you a little story about his father also, since we're mentioning about the Reichiks. His father, when my brother married uh, the youngest in the family, my sister-in-law, so her father, Rabbi Reichik, was already elderly. He was probably, like, I think, 70 years old at the time, or maybe, maybe even, maybe a little less than 70, maybe 69, 68. And uh, he was pretty frail. <laughs> So after a year or two, I think I was visiting my brother. I helped Rabbi Reichik go to the mikveh. He went to mikveh every day. It's Rabbi Reichik Sr., the, the father. And uh, even when he was frail, there's no such thing as not going to mikveh. It took him 45 minutes to go in and out. Someone had to literally go in the mikveh with him to hold him. He was frail. He could not, couldn't even walk. And, and the Messiah's nefesh and the, the, the total dedication, the devotion to Chassidus was like, you didn't need to read any books. You needed to hear any story. You just watched him. He was a living embodiment of everything. 
You know the story with the mikvah. I told you the story with the mikvah. When he came, he used to get he used to get mishloach manas from the rabbi because the rabbi gave to a kohen leaving in Yisrael. So the rabbi used to give it to Rabbi Shmuel Levitin, who was the mashpia and the rav and Lubavitch. Shmuel Levitin passed away in like 1971 or 72. After he passed away, Rabbi Reichik became the levy. He was a levy. So Rabbi Reichik was the levy that the rabbi gave to. So Rabbi Reichik would fly into New York, airport him to get mishloach manas from the rabbi. So one year, towards the end of his life, he was he had gotten cellulitis that on his foot, and he was an infection. In the hospital is recovering, he, and, and he under no circumstances was he going to entertain the thought of missing the opportunity to get mishloach manas from the rebbe. So he told his doctor, who was a frumi, he had said to go to the rebbe for mishloach manas. So finally, the doctor said, "Okay, you can travel to New York, but but you can't go to Mikveh because he had an infection on his foot." Even though the Balshemtiv said. And if you table once, you, you, you will never get harmed from just one field. Anyway, but by him, there was no such thing as not to table. It couldn't be. So he stayed over. He came to New York. He stayed at my brother's house. My brother's a young curly young man. I was just married to, to his daughter a year or two. And, and they warned my brother, who's the young son in law, he's a very actually cannot go to mikveh. Make sure he doesn't go. And his, his mother in law said that to him, don't make sure she doesn't, he doesn't go. Because he knew he was going to want to go. Comes the morning. And Rabbi Reichik says to my brother, Chaim, there was a mikvah on the block. They lived, my brother lived across the street from 770 by the bank, on top of the bank. There was a mikvah by Kerestir on the corner of Eastern Parkway in Brooklyn Avenue, on this side of the street. So he says, Chaim, kum lamagayne mikveh. Chaim, let's go to the mikveh. My brother says, but Father Shriger, my brother in law said, your wife said that we're not allowed to, can't take you. I'm safe. So, and he says, also well, the brother in law said I should. So he says, Chaim, Chaim, let's go to the mikveh. So he says, but they said I could take. Chaim, come along, guy, mikveh. So Chaim says, okay, let's go. He's like, I'm, Chaim's like, says to me later, he's like, he's a holy man. You know what I'm saying? He's got connections up there. I'm not stopping him. You know what I mean? He, I, I did my thing, and that was it. Then he went, and nothing happened. But he wasn't. There's no such thing as him going to, you know, to the rebbe without going to mikveh first. That wasn't an option. A very holy Jew. It's another story. It's in the book. There's a whole book about Rabbi Reichik. In fact, Rabbi Shimi Reichik helped write it. So you should, I, would, I would encourage you to, to read the book. So in the, in the story, in the book there, he, he had to once travel from Los Angeles to Long Beach for the bris. So one of the, 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 the women from the, from the Lubavitcher ladies in the community, she was going to, to, to Long Beach. She was driving. Rabbi Reichik didn't drive. So she gave Rabbi Reichik a, a ride. So he comes in the, in the car, he has in his hand, he's got this mimer, uh, I think he's learning a mimer from the Rebbe. And, and she's all nervous because she's driving Rabbi Reichik. She's nervous. So she's, she's in the car and he, so he says to her, don't be nervous, it's okay, it's fine. Like he just calms her down and that was it. He was just so, while he was so lofty, he was also very, very, very much down to earth and very much connected to, uh, to, the, to the world. You know the story with the baby? You know the story, you know the story with the baby? Yeah, you know the story. What? You know the story with the Ramam also. The end of, with the Ramam. You know the story with the Chassan? Yeah. He, uh, at the end of his life, he, uh, he's come to the Rebbe every year since Pastera. And he wanted to come to the host of Pastera. And the Rebbe said to me, come for half. And he so only only with the condition that you have someone's going to take over your shlichas. So Rebbe said you have to ask a local rav. Rabbi Reichik found the chassidish rav is going to understand that he's going to get permission. He wants to make sure the rav is going to give him the answer he wanted and go to the rebbe. So he found someone to make sure they take over the shlichas. Rabbi Reichik chose to go for the first half of the history, hoping that the rebbe will let him stay. But then it would get close to sukkah. The rebbe said to him, like, "What are you here? You have to go back." He went back. Anyway, the last few years of his life, he was he, he was he was in Los Angeles. So some pastor when they started the coffers, so he uh, there was there was a there was a young man who was given the first hakafa and needed a bracha for children. He refused to start hakafas. This is already after Gimel Thomas. It's like Tafshin and Vav, I think it was. Rabbi Rashi passed away on Ches, and he refused to start hakafas till he got a bracha from Rabbi Rashi. Kids. So a rhetoric tried to push him off, but he refused, and, and he got, gave him a bracha, and he had a child that year. Then uh, there was also a guy who needed to be, become a chassan, who was trying to get engaged, and a told him he had to learn an He did, and then he became a chassan.
Yes, uh, before I came here, yeah. um, my son was kind of saying, no, we should go for this fair. I was like, no, I'm not sure. And I wrote to the rebbe, and the answer I got to him was Kurdish, because there was a letter to Rabbi Raji telling him not to come, telling him you should stay in your city, and you and you should uh, have a seder to, to, to get organized and stay in your city. Yeah. And so I said, okay, although Hakimah stays, but I'm not moving. You guys. And the answer from the Rebbe. Everyone gets their answer. Yeah. There's also also letters from the Rebbe to Rabbi Reitschik. He was a very, very, if you saw pictures of him, he was a very, he was not into Gashmith. And Gashmith was like, and the Rebbe told him to eat for health. So he, he, he told his doctor, tell him, and his wife, when his wife was in the Yechidah, she told the Rebbe, told him, make sure your husband eats. So he was told he has to eat at least an apple a day. So when he would travel around the world, he was a person who had no interest in Gashmas. He asked his host if they could have an apple. People were a little surprised that Rabbi Reichik, you know, Gashmas doesn't matter, whatever you give him, he'll take. Of course, with a you know, good Gashmas, et cetera. They found out later, he used to ask for the apple because the Rebbe told him. An apple day. The doctor said that. It was yes to, you know, take care of herself that way. Anyway, so Rachi Kham is having a chama. Should be zeichet to Mashiach. Should be united with all our loved ones and kids around the Sheikh. So we say chum. Ah. Yeah. Now, if you want to know what's in my smoothie, okay, okay. I can tell you, but you're not going to tell everybody. I'm a little bit full. What? You also want to? Wait, you want? Okay, I'll tell you. I'll tell you what's in my smoothie. I'll tell you almost all the ingredients. Some of it is a little bit confidential, secret, a little recipe. I have, first of all, I put spirulina in here. That's what makes it so dark. And then I put in flax seeds. I put in also. Um, no, no, I made it at home. Yeah. And then I. And then I also put in uh, what do you call wheat germ? Wheat germ? See that one there? And then, and then I put in a bunch of fruits, a little juice, and then I put in some strawberries, blueberries. If I have pineapple, I put them depending on what's available. Today we had not the pineapple wasn't cut, so it looks a little darker. It usually it gets a little lighter. Why? Because of spirulina makes it dark, plus the blueberries. Yeah, the blueberries. <laughs> It keeps me full for five hours, so I don't eat any nash, at least, at least till the afternoon. Wow. But then late at night, it depends what's happening. Sometimes I start to slip a little bit then. Anyway, that's the story. Okay, so next week is Hanukkah. We have class next week? Anybody know? Yeah? yeah? Okay. So class Thursday? Okay, so I want to wish you all a and Hanukkah. Thank you. Thank you. And... Uh, should be lichtik, should be illuminated all the days of our lives. And illuminate the world around us. Special time, Hanukkah. Yeah. You know what the Rebbe said to my father? The Rebbe said, Haste of Hanukkah, his name is Hanukkah. As all fun, learn a Hanukkah time. Should come learning a Hanukkah time. So the Rebbe actually associated our last name with my father starting to learn in 770. My father came a week after Hanukkah, Asar Batavis, 1962. Very special time of the year. And by the way, just parenthetically, all my sisters were born around Hanukkah time. Wow. So it's a Hanukkah. My son was born, his bris was on Hanukkah, the first, first day of Hanukkah. So there's a certain Hanukkah, it's like Hanukkah, Hanukkah, some kind of uh, energy. Anyway, okay, should be lichtik, and uh, all the brachas. The recipe for the smoothie is uh, depends on the day. Right? I put in a lot of stuff. Whatever I can find in the freezer, that's true. Looks good. I thought you buy it somewhere. No, no.